The Nickelodeon website has always been a great place to find different crossovers for our favorite cartoons. Many of us might be familiar with the Super Brawl series, a series of fighting games that combined the ongoing Nickelodeon shows throughout the 2010s. It was really popular and kept fans coming back to the website, but there was another big crossover series that spanned a few shows in the 2010s. This was Nickelodeon Block Party. The first game came out in 2011 and was developed by MP Game Studio. That's right, the same company that developed the early Super Brawl games before Workin' Man took over. Even a few SpongeBob sprites were taken from Super Brawl 2, which came out a year before. So let's see how they did with this one. The game plays in a style similar to Mario Party. It actually reminds me of the online SpongeBob board games made by Sarbakken. It mostly bears a resemblance to their Truth or Square game. The characters we can choose from include SpongeBob from SpongeBob, Mikey from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Carly and Sam from iCarly, Fanboy and Chum Chum, Dudley and Kitty from Tough Puppy, Skipper from The Penguins of Madagascar, and even Sheen from Planet Sheen. Rumor has it he was from some other show before it. I can't remember the name of it, it was probably obscure. We also have Tori and Cat from Victorious. Now you might be thinking that Cat's actress looks at least a little familiar to you. This is because she actually voiced Diazpro in the Nickelodeon dub of Winx Club, a career-defining performance if I do say so myself. Bloom and Sky did her so dirty. I also remember thinking it was weird that Rico got into Jingle Brawl over Skipper, so I guess they had some contractual agreement over which games they would be in. Apart from the characters, every stage is a different world from whatever show it came from. Three players take turns rolling a die and moving whatever number of spaces it lands on. Each tile space produces a different result. Some spaces make you gain coins, lose coins, send you forward, or send you backwards. In every map, a character from the represented show narrates everything and guides you through the board. You can even land on spaces that'll ask you a trivia question about the show. Even if you don't know the answer, it's fairly obvious if you have a general understanding of the show's humor. It's really cool to see the sets as you move through them. They have an impressive amount of detail. You can also land on a shop space that'll allow you to buy some kind of advantage. I often forget I have them, though. You can also run into characters from each show, and for one reason or another, they'll demand that you pay them. In the Penguin stage, it's because you discover their secret hideout. It's kind of clever. Coins are important because you spend most of the game traveling the board to reach a much bigger coin. You have to spend 20 smaller coins in order to claim it once you found it. Other big coins are given to whoever lands on the most red or blue spaces, whoever earns the most coins in minigames, and whoever answers the most trivia questions correctly. Whoever has the most in the end wins. So now let's check out some of these minigames. After everyone takes a turn, a wheel is spun to determine which show you'll be playing a minigame from. One of the most common ones is Demanding Goat from the Jeanette McCurdy and Diaz Pro show. All the players have to click and drag the demanded food into a goat's mouth as it shakes the table. It's mostly easy, but sometimes the AI will become faster than the speed of light just out of nowhere. There's another where you have to close your own colored lockers while opening everyone else's, and another where you catch jellyfish in bubbles to defend your flag. There's also an air hockey one that I'm terrible at, no surprise there, and one where you destroy your spacebar to lick a lollipop faster than everyone else. Spacebars are a little flimsy and I never feel good about button mashing them. Maybe the mouse or a different key would have been more comfortable. I think my personal favorite is this one where you're running uphill and avoiding heaps of garbage that roll down at you. Though it's hard to tell where the hitboxes are since I can narrowly avoid close calls sometimes better than others, but it's still fun. I also have mixed feelings on this door one that reminds me of Hotel Mario. Nice of Sam and Cat to invite us over for a picnic, eh, Sheen? You have to go through doors in the right order to reach the finish, but there is a bit of chance involved. You can learn the pattern if you pay attention, but one of the players could just get a lucky break right away. Another hard one is where you have to jump over this spinning spatula. It's hard to detect when exactly you're supposed to jump. Another tough one is where you're running from the girl from Fanboy and Chum Chum. You have to mash the left and right keys to keep moving. It seems easy, but it always slows down on me for no real reason and I end up getting caught. This one where you jump on the bed is also really hard to understand. You have to hit the space bar when you touch down to give yourself more air, but I can't really figure out how it works. I'm also conflicted on this one where you run with pizza and lose a slice whenever you hit an obstacle. Some of the obstacles are just impossible to avoid and guarantee you'll lose a slice. There's also a challenging one where you have to balance on a shifting log while a monkey from Madagascar throws bananas at you. I guess it's a better alternative than what he threatens to throw in the movie. Some others that I like are this one where you jump to platforms as they slowly fall, which requires a good bit of strategy. And another one where you have to pick up correctly colored fleas and drop them in a bucket. And one more thing. Some of the music is awesome in this. Check out this rockin' take on the iCarly theme. Ooh. 
Also, the Ninja Turtles song. So even with the more challenging minigames, this is pretty fun. You can get a lot of enjoyment out of it. It really seems like it was made to be multiplayer, but it's still fun without it. So it's no surprise that they decided to give it a sequel. However, Block Party 2 was not developed by MP Game Studio. Just like with the Super Brawl series, development was passed on to Workin' Man. Darn, it must be MP Game Studios' destiny to start franchises for Workin' Man to eventually take over. Now we love Workin' Man on this channel. They've made plenty of great games for Nickelodeon and other shows. They're highly reputable, and I always expect quality media from them. So let's see how they handled Block Party 2. Oh, it's unforgivable. Right away, they've committed the greatest sin any Nickelodeon game developer could possibly imagine doing. They included the pig and the goat, but not the banana or the cricket. How do you make this mistake? It's a simple fact of humanity that pig, goat, banana, and cricket are inseparable. I don't know if we can play this, it's just too much to take in. I've never seen a single episode of that show. So our roster includes Pig and Goat, all four Ninja Turtles, Spongebob Patrick, Harvey Beaks, and also Fee and Foo from his show. And I'm sorry, but every time I hear Harvey Beaks, I can only imagine Harvey Birdman. I will never not confuse those two. Right away, this seems like a downgrade with even fewer shows to choose from, the inability to choose who you play against, and only four boards. But let's give it the benefit of the doubt. So, this is what you get. Hmm... Ha, huh. hmm, hmm. Well, it's different. You don't even get to see your character, you just get an icon to represent them. The boards don't look that different either. They just have characters from each show milling around. No matter how long you set the game to be, the board is still really small. So let's see some of the mini games. The most common one is Boogie Down Bear. It's kind of hard to understand, but you have to click your speaker when a white light appears in it. It isn't as creative or enjoyable as anything from the first game, but it isn't bad. But this next one is. All you do is click a space and hope there isn't a bomb underneath it. There's no strategy whatsoever. You can go from winning the game to falling behind all because of chance. That's no fun. It isn't the only one like this either. There's this really weird weird one where you have to randomly guess which character has the longest legs. Again, there's no strategy, it's just guessing. How did they even come up with this? That's a really weird concept for a game. Another one is a sort of memory game where you have to remember which tiles are where so you can uncover them. At least there's some kind of strategy involved. But this other one is just weird. You have to hold a whoopee cushion down to have the loudest fart. Listen, I already had to suffer through a bunch of Elsa Gate games in a different video. Keep this as far away from me as possible. There's another one where you have to suck fudge balls into your vacuum. It isn't really clear where you're supposed to click, though. So yeah, both as a sequel and as a standalone game, I don't think this one is especially remarkable. There's too much luck involved, and the minigames just aren't interesting. I'm not sure if Workin' Man had a smaller budget than MP, but this was at least a few steps back from its predecessor. But the third one is a lot different, so let's give it a try and see if it can improve. This one went back to the style of the first, but it was also developed by Workin' Man. This time, with the exception of SpongeBob and Raphael, we have an entirely new cast. Kid Danger, Lincoln from The Loud House, Babe and Kenzie from The Game Shakers, and Phoebe from The Thundermans. Looks like the live actions outnumber the cartoons this time. Kinda sad that the cast is so small. You'd expect it to get bigger as the series went along. Once again, you can't choose who you compete against. It isn't a deal breaker, but it's still nice to have the option. You have six boards to choose from from each of the shows. You can play through Bikini Bottom, The Loud House, The Game Shaker's Headquarters, A Few Superhero Lairs, or The Magical World of New York City. This one is very similar to the first, so I appreciate that they tried to replicate it. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. This time, you're trying to reach a finish line, so that's really all that matters in the end. One thing that irks me about this one is that whenever a minigame is activated, a wheel spins to select it. Sometimes it can take an egregiously long time to select a game. The developers likely thought this would make it more suspenseful, but it just makes it more of a drag to wait for. The minigames are mostly alright though. I like this one where you're jumping across rooftops and trying to outlast the others. There's a game of Candy Crush where you match donuts while the other characters throw stuff on the board. And there's a Halloween one where you try to catch flying candy. There's one where you try not to step on a space that'll cause you to get sucked into a tube. And one where you try to catch pizza slices with claws. I kept grabbing the bad pizzas which take points away from you because this game had no instructions. It just started. Obviously I'm gonna assume they're collectible because they have stuff on them. But they do kind kind of remind me of the evil pizzas from that one Planet Sheen spin-off most people don't know about. There are also a few minigames that are basically just the same as a few others. There's one where you jump across clouds like in the rooftop stage, and one where you catch a million falling Garys and Snellies from a tree. 
Hey, why's SpongeBob trying to stop me from saving his snail? Also, the snails meow in agony if you don't catch them. And I thought the tuna joke in Operation Krabby Patty was dark. Speaking of AWE games, there's one where you glide around and avoid Krang like in that one minigame from the SpongeBob movie PC game. No, I will never miss an opportunity to reference that underrated masterpiece. There's also one like the pizza game where you're trying to stop Plankton from stealing Krabby Patties. Once again, no instructions. Some of the other minigames can also be surprisingly hard. There's one where you're in hamster balls and trying to ring out everyone else, but there isn't really a well-defined arena. There's another where you bounce yourself into an onslaught of pillows, trying to keep yourself from falling by slamming into more flying pillows. The strategic platform jumper from the first game has also made a return, but one of the hardest ones is where you're trying to stop your brainwashed teammates from running loose. I can't figure out how the trajectory of your aim works. Another tough one is where you have to run away from a giant snake in Goo Lagoon. You smash your mouse button repeatedly, and even though I'm a fairly fast clicker, I still find myself falling behind a lot. Minigames aside, the board is also quite different than the first time around. You don't have to answer trivia questions anymore, which is disappointing since I liked that feature in the first. There also aren't as many unique interactions with the environment. Sure, the tile hazard animations are more unique, but we lost the more charming details that utilize different aspects of the shows. Also, while the animation is consistent and not a 2D, 3D blend like in the first game, I'm not really sure if I prefer the look this time around. Kenzie and Babe give off completely different energy than they do in the show. Having not seen the Game Shakers before playing this, I assumed they were secretaries in an office or something like that. I still think the game is decent, but I don't think it stands up to the first one. While the first does run circles around the others, I think at least some enjoyment can be had with all three of these. The overall concept is still interesting, and there's a lot to enjoy, but we aren't entirely finished just yet. Working Man didn't keep the concept of Block Party limited to just crossover games. They actually went ahead and made a whole version just for the show Game Shakers. Let's take a quick look at that one. It's very similar to 3, but it has a new feature that makes it worthwhile. You have the ability to build your own stage to play through. Now, it's extremely complicated, and it would probably take hours to make one that's actually cohesive, but it's still nice to have the option. Kinda wish they had this in the Nickelodeon versions. Imagine the boards you could create by combining things from all the different shows. Aside from that, this one doesn't have quite as much to work with as the crossovers do. You only have the four main characters from the show and only one pre-made board. I'm also assuming all the minigames are supposed to be games developed by the Game Shakers in-universe. A lot of them are essentially the same as the ones in Block Party 3, just with different graphics and premises. There's one where running butts are shooting at you just as long as they don't fart. And the game is super short, so it's easy to play a quick round. It's just a standalone game, it's fine for what it is. At the end of the day, this was an interesting concept for Nickelodeon to try out. It's a shame they stopped making these after the third one. Imagine how fun it would be to have even more Nicktoons with their respective universes to play through. But who knows, maybe the next one will get a console release like All-Star Brawl. Not likely, but wouldn't that be funny? Either way, it's nice to look back on these and play through them again all these years later. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.